Hey, what's up guys? We're just getting ready to record our next web episode with Dr. Gott and one of our fellows. Just want to give a special thanks to our sponsors and let us know how you can follow us. For those of you who have enjoyed the series, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Wash You Nephrology. You can follow me on Twitter at Maximal Change and send me an email to the link that you can see here. Our sponsors, a big thank you to the Renal Fellow Network who have endorsed us as an educational resource. They've been really great. Uh, AJ Kitty blog and Nephron Power are two other really uh, excellent nephrology blogs. The Nephrology Journal Club, which is a great online resource where uh, they chat about the most recent brown, brown, uh, groundbreaking and uh, landmark trials in nephrology. And uh, Nephrology on Demand, which is a Google site here uh, where you can download some uh, really great nephrology apps. So uh, thanks again for following us, and we'll be right back with uh, some renal pathology teaching. Welcome back to our next web episode. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Gott. Thank you again for being here. We also have Dr. Sagar Gupta, one of our fellows. So before we begin, let me get the laser pointer over to Joe so that you can use this when we get started. So um, the case, uh, as I walk through it here, Starts with a 32 year old male who presents with T colored urine, edema, and hypertension. His creatinine is 1.7. UA shows 3 plus blood, 3 plus, 3 plus protein. His urine sediment shows RBC casts. A protein to creatinine ratio in the urine is 3.8 grams per gram. So, the serologies that I'm giving you, he has a very low C3 at 18. His C4 is normal at 16. All other serologies, ANA, double-stranded DNA, HIV, Hep B, Hep C are all negative, and anything else that you would want is still pending. So kind of given this brief history, Sagar, mm -hmm. kind of what's on your differential with the proteinuria hematuria and the low complement levels? So this is a relatively young guy, 32-year-old male who comes in with a nephritic presentation, sounds like hematuria, proteinuria, and high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Although in some syndromes we can see a nephrotic range proteinuria also, given the 3.8 grams on the spot. So I still think nephritic mm -hmm. plus minus nephrotic range proteinuria. Of course, the complements are low, so there's something going on there. So what we'll goes through your head when you think low complement levels nephritic syndrome? Uh, sure. So um, uh, like uh, endocarditis mm -hmm. can give you that. Um, you can get those with cryoglobulinemia, mm -hmm. but C4 is usually lower than C3. Mm -hmm. Lupus can do that. Then the MPGN kind of syndromes, more with dense deposit disease rather than C3 glomerular nef uh, nephritis can give you a low C3. And um, other causes are like outside GN, rhabdomyolysis, or being... Um, um, oh, that's a, good, yeah. that's a good differential. Anything you, else you'd want to add to that, Joe? No, I think that's good. Okay, so we mentioned infection associated. We mentioned lupus, although the serologies don't show that, MPGN, cryo. That's a good differential for this um, um, presentation. So let's see what the histology shows. So I'll pass it over to you, Joe. So this is light microscopy, low power. Looks like H&E staining. H&E, correct. So starting from the periphery, um, I think we are in the cortex here because mm -hmm. the tubules are all back to back. Um, there is some interstitial inflammation, I would say, because the tubules get spaced out right where you were pointing, and there are some inflammatory cells in there. Mm -hmm. um, it is Was that the blood vessel you were looking at? So the major these are some tubules right tubules. here. Uh, so okay. what's going on with the tubules themselves? Like look at this one down here in particular. So the tubules are pretty dilated, right. and mm -hmm. um, the epithelial, the cells and the brush border line, that is not seen so clearly on well, the... It's, it's difficult to appreciate the brush border on the H&E, but the PAS will help us with that. Mm -hmm. But they do appear, as you're alluding to, they appear dilated, and they also have this epithelial simplification, so they've lost some cytoplasmic volume. And those findings are typical in what, what setting? So, what so is happening? acute tubular injury. Acute tubular injury, excellent. So you, you mentioned we are in the cortex. We do have a little bit of uh, patchy inflammation throughout the, in the interstitium. And then we do have a few glomeruli here, which we will... We will get to on higher power. I'm sure we'll be able to see what's going on there. But immediately right off the bat, you don't see any. I don't see them to be collapsed or with major uh, necrotizing inflammation or crescents in right. the Bowman space. There's no, there's no singularity in Bowman space. There's no crescent in these in these glomeruli that we see here. 
-hmm. and we don't see any obvious necrotizing lesions at, at this magnification. Let me give you a higher power of one of these glomeruli. So again, this is light microscopy, still looks to be the HNE staining. Um, so uh, commenting on the glomerulus, the symmetry looks okay. Again, no necrotizing lesions or crescents in the Bowman space. Going inwards, looking at the capillary loops, um, I see a lot of them are closed here. I, I don't see a lot of them being open. You don't see the lumens very lumens. well. True. And uh, what do we see in there instead of a capillary lumen? Uh, there seems to be a, uh, I guess, a cellular uh, process going on. There's cells. The cells. So when we have lumen. cells in the capillary lumens like this, how do we? What do we? What do we call that? We also have some some mixed cell types. Again, endocapillary we'll proliferation. So there's a little endocapillary proliferation. Very good. And then and we then have looking at. Um, what are all these cell types that are in here? Quite a few, more than we would mm -hmm. normally expect for just passing through. Um, all this looks like, is it neutrophils, multi-lobed cells? Yes, those are polymorphonuclear leukocytes, so mm -hmm. neutrophils. And then commenting on the mesangium, uh, right around the 12 to 2 o'clock position, I do see some mesangial expansion. Maybe, and maybe a, some mild, like maybe right here, some mild mesangial hypercellular, but most of the action is endocapillary proliferation with some, with some exudative features, these neutrophils that we're seeing here. And we don't see any crescents, we don't see any necrotizing lesions. And the visceral epithelial cells, you know, we see a little prominent here in a, a few of them, the photocytes, but nothing else to really yeah. remark on. On the HNE, it's kind of hard to comment on the capillary wall thickness right now. Capillary wall thickness um, and duplication, very difficult to appreciate on HNE. HNE we'll have PAS so and silver stains and, 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 so and things like that. So let's, let's kind of think through your differential a little bit and what mm -hmm. we're uh, what we're looking at here. So we have endocarditis, we have, um, what were some of the things, lupus? We could have IgA, lupus, MPGN from MPGN. C3 or even the older type 1 nomenclature, okay. or cryoglobulinemia as we talked about. And cryo. So now <clears throat> with endocarditis, it can, it can have multiple looks. I mean, some of the things, the ways it might present, I mean, how would you, what would you think of when you're thinking endocarditis and looking at a kidney biopsy? So uh, it could still come with this endocapillary proliferation, some mesangial expansion and hypercellularity. Like more more the endocapillary proliferation. Mesangial hypercellularity we tend to think of more with IgA. IgA. Um, but certainly endocapillary proliferation is possible. It's typically more a focal necrotizing glomerulonephritis or a crescentic glomerulonephritis yeah. or focal crescentic glomerulonephritis in cases of, of bacterial endocarditis. But it can have a varied response. And then of course MPGN. We will know more about that as we go through the special mm -hmm. stains. Um, and that we can see the tram tracking, tram track the cap doubling yes. of the capillary walls. Very um, good. And cryo? Um, what does a cryo deposit really look like on light microscopy? Like if we saw one of those in the capillary lumen. Is it like the pseudo emboli? Yeah, they're kind of, kind of pseudo thrombi. There are these, there are these very homogeneous, almost look like hyaline. Okay. Um, very smooth looking, homogeneous, um, hyaline sort of pseudo thrombi that we, we will see stuffed in these capillary loops. And we don't see anything like that on this particular image. All right, let's keep going. I'm sure there's more, yeah. more pictures for there's us. more. Um, so this is again light microscopy. Still looks like the HME stain. And um, this glomerulus, um, again, the endocapillary proliferation is again well appreciated here. Um, on the first look, I would say there's some mesangial hypercellularity in a lot of areas. So mild, we're down here at the pole, so you don't want to overinterpret over, this particular okay. area. So that I would steer clear of this being too much mesangial hypercellularity, maybe a few too many here, but for the most part, we're right. seeing more of the, uh, the neutrophils again, mm -hmm. um, quite a few, and then this endocapillary proliferation. Okay. Now, what do we have going on down here in this particular So tubule? that looks like a tubular cast. Yes, and, and what is this made of? Um, so this is uh, eosinophilic material filling the tubular lumen. And see how it's got, it's kind of these little shapes in here. It's difficult to appreciate, but maybe that's slightly mm. refractile. But this is, looks like a red cell, red cell cast, cast or maybe some lysed red blood cells in this particular tubule going along with the hematuria. Hematuria and the nephritic picture. And the nephritic picture. So it looks pretty similar to the last one. Yep. And this one is similar but different at mm. the same time.
so again, like microscopy, HNE staining, um, this clomerulus, I think that's a, is that a crescent? Yes. Uh, from the 9 to 12 o'clock. And yeah, this, it, right, this semicircle sort of right here, this um, crescent occupying Bowman space. It clearly has are. more than three cell layers. Mm -hmm. That is what the crescent would cl uh, classify as. And then rest of the glomerulus, I don't see many capillary loops to be open there. And again, <coughs> if, uh, at a higher power, we may see those cells are in the capillary lumen. And sure. then again, those red uh, tubular casts appreciated out there. The interstitium still looks okay, but maybe mild inflammation going on. Mild, but most of the action here is in the glomerulus, and we do have the acute tubular injury findings again uh, in the tubules out here, this dilatation and epithelial simplification. And But again, like you were saying, you're exactly correct. These are This is a, a crescent, and maybe some fibrin right here. It's hard to say at this at this magnification and on the H and E, but perhaps a little, a little necrosis, but the endocapillary proliferation, and now we have a crescent. Crescent. Okay. So this is a crescentic GN. Well, well you gotta be careful with that terminology. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have the report saying, you know, X number of glomeruli were involved with the crescent, but to, to call something a crescentic GN, you have to have more than 50% 50 involvement. Of it. But certainly a crescent involves an active necrotizing process. All right, so let me just give you a silver. So this is like microscopy, silver staining. Um, the capillary uh, loops, they've kind of look thickened on here. And well, it's, we don't have a good tubular basement membrane to compare, compare to. to. So at the most, very mild, but not, not too impressive. What, what are we, what is missing here that we would expect to see with, say, MPGN? Um, with MPGN you mentioned it earlier, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the key diagnostic findings for membrane proliferative glomerular nephritis. It's a tram track, it's tram track. A doubling of the capillary contour. Right. And we don't quite see that we doubling. Don't, we don't see that here. You want to look out here at the periphery and it should have a nice duplication of mm -hmm. tram track appearance and we don't it's see not present. We don't see any of that. Interestingly, in this particular image, we don't see the endocapillary proliferation too well either. It, maybe it's just the the stain but uh, or this particular glomerulus and we don't have a crescent in this in this um, image either but the most important thing is not seeing those tram tracks that we would expect for an MPGN. So Sagar before I go on to the immunofluorescence so based on your differential that you mentioned which was a good differential for hypocomplementemia and <coughs> nephritic syndrome uh, what is highest on your differential given the neutrophilic infiltrate and the lack of tram tracking? So, of course, the MPGN and C3 glomerulopathies, they go quite down on the list okay. now. Um, the neutrophil endocapillary proliferation could still be at the part of the general, like, you know, endocarditis could still do sure. that. Yeah. Um, I think bad IgA could present like that. Yeah, although IgA typically doesn't lead to a neutrophilic infiltrate like we saw. It can lead to a lot of endocapillary proliferation, mesangial hypercellular, but I've never seen neutrophils in an IgA personally. I don't know if... No, that would be very unusual. Yeah, yeah, so it would be weird. So neutrophils in the glomerulus really point us towards some kind of infectious process. Infection. So, then, so the next question before I show you the images is if this is an infection associated glomerular nephritis, what would you expect to see on immunofluorescence or EM? So um, typical post-infectious or infection associated, uh, you can see a positive C3 mm -hmm. and a positive IgG. Great. And on EM, uh, the, well, the textbook appearance is going to be the subepithelial hump. Great. Uh, you see. Great. So let's see if we see that. So here's C3. So this looks like granular pattern for C3 staining. Again, this could be consistent with the infectious picture we're thinking of, or right. just the uh, endocarditis related. And of course, sorry. Very good. Um, right. So this is this is very bright granular C3 staining. You can see it highlighting the capillary loops quite nicely. So that would fit very well with, with what, we're, what we're expecting. Had we seen some tram tracking, it would still fit with the C3 glomerulopathy and dense deposit disease. But sure. 
You yes. didn't see that on the. We did not see that. So those are. That is low on. Yeah. I think those are out okay. at this point. But let's keep going. All right. And IgG was the same. I don't have a picture, but it is a similar kind of coarse granular pattern. So, okay. this is the only tough part about this case. Here's the EM. This is the only EM picture I'm going to give you. So uh, I think your pointer is mm -hmm. on one of on the a few of these things here. Yep, those look like the subepithelial humps, and um, uh, that is in the center is a mesangial cell. Uh, those are again yeah, the humps and. Well, uh, look at where we are here. Yeah, or uh, always start by orienting yourself on EM because it's a little confusing this picture because you have all these mm -hmm. loops kind of together, so. So look at where we are here. So we have, um, just follow out the capillary loop is the best way to orient yourself. So here we are. Uh, you can you see the foot processes uh -huh. out here. So bone in space. Here's a big endothelial cell nucleus. This would be the, the lumen. And then you follow it down and you come across here. This would be in the sandial cell, cell, cell nucleus. nucleus. And now we can kind of localize these deposits. So we have a deposit here, which is, where is that? Right by this mesangial cell nucleus. Um, Both of these here, really. It's pretty much in the mesangial. Yeah. Right? So when, the yeah, whenever you see deposits. them, you, you, should, you should call them mesangial the deposits. deposits. So non -specific. mesangial deposits, and then we have these out here. Okay. So where are we on this? Those look like almost subendothelial. Yeah. They do, intramembranous. Some of them are surrounded by the membrane, so maybe intramembranous here. Um, and some very small mm -hmm. subendothelial deposits. We have more EM pictures here. No, this is the only one, and, and um, you know, this is a real case, so I can't, you know, make everything exactly like a textbook. So let's so let's <laughs> think through this now that we're seeing. We have IgG and we have C3. We don't know the rest of the IF results at this point. Uh, I think it was just IgG and C3 positive so, in, that pa in the pattern that you saw. Um, and they're not giant sub epithelial humps. Then we're not really seeing those on the on EM here. We're seeing immune complex deposits in varying locations. So when you see immune complexes in different locations like this, what are some things you think of? So I think lupus can give you deposits anyway. Lupus is something you really need to think of. I mean that is we don't have all the serologies back. Yeah, I don't remember. Correct. Yeah, the the, the, the lupus the, serologies were negative, but everything else was were negative. Yeah, I'll, and I'll tell you kind of the, the rest of the clinical history after we kind of make a histologic diagnosis. I'll just let that phone ring. Sorry about that. Go ahead. So that is one thing to think about. Um, and some other things to think about, as you mentioned, were these infection-associated glomerular infirmities, which has to be high on your list with the neutrophilic infiltrate and the C3 and the IgG. Or could this just be some sort of immune complex-mediated glomerular nephritis? The patient has other, some sort of other... Um, other autoimmune condition that may be leading to something, but that would be, um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that would produce this type of a, of a, of a picture on light IF and EM. So it still fits with immune complex or an infection associated glare nephritis, but it's certainly not your classic um, a post-infectious streptococcal type glomerular nephritis. But endocarditis would certainly still want to know what's going on with the patient's heart. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, for further work up, some blood cultures, does this patient have any hardware? Is it a staphylococcus aureus infection somewhere? Right. And again, the echo to look for endocarditis. Yeah, and right. Now, now staph BB infections, shunts and those very, very true. IgA was negative as well. Right? So negative. there is the IgA dominant IgA infection associated glomerular nephritis. Again, we don't have any humps anywhere, and presumably, if you looked through this whole biopsy, there's not going to be any humps that we would that we would find. Um, so, you know, the other thing is IgA being negative, the MRSA infections, which are typically IgA dominant, IgA associated um, dominant uh, uh, glomerular nephritis infection associated glomerular nephritis, that we're not really we don't have that pattern here based on the IF. So, I would not favor a typical MRSA or staph infection in this case. But certainly endocarditis or some other type of infection is, is is high on the list here. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, not every um, kidney biopsy goes exactly by the textbook. Like if you saw subepithelial hubs here, I think there would be no doubt that this was an infection associated GN. But, you know, the, the, the location of these deposits made it a little bit questionable, but you still have to kind of render some kind of histologic diagnosis. And the diagnosis that was made on the biopsy here was still favored in infection-associated 
Lemarin Lefranus. Um, but it is unusual. It is, it not, is, it is a little bit unusual. On this one. Right. And um, so, and that is what this patient ended up having. I didn't give all of that in the history. He did have uh, actually a preceding streptococcal infection. This patient actually had the classic elevated ASO titer and everything as well, which kind of helped us support this diagnosis, even though the deposits weren't in, in the right space. So we called this a post-infectious glomerulonephritis. It's also in the past been called a post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And now with strep not being very common, we're kind of moving towards calling this an infection-associated glomerulonephritis. So just a quick word about the classic post-infectious GN. You know, it is a classic serum sickness response. So you have a preceding streptococcal infection, which then develops antigen and in the body, which leads to this disease uh, state in the kidney two to four weeks later. Um, very different than IgA, which uh, occurs with a concomitant infection where you develop the hematuria right away. Um, there's not a lot of prognostic data in adults. A lot of the prognostic data is taken from epidemics. One famous example from the 60s is in Trinidad and Tobago. And the prognosis in these patients who are mostly children is really good on long-term follow-up, but it is more guarded in adults. So we're going to talk about this more. Um, the histologic findings classically, as we've discussed and demonstrated, at least according to the textbook, light microscopy should show this neutrophilic glomerular infiltrate. And really not a whole lot of things lead to neutrophils within the glomerulus. So whenever I see that, I think this may be some kind of infection-associated GM. Um, with the endocapillary proliferation, the IF will show the coarse granular IgG and C3, as you mentioned. And again, classically, you would see these subepithelial humps, which we didn't see in this picture. This is a, an image taken from an online source, which I think more demonstrates this classic hump, classic. which we didn't see in this case. Um, but not everything fits a textbook. Correct. Okay. So let's move on. We have a we have next case is similar. Okay, we're we're still um, kind of in the same same realm of of thinking. So here's the case discussion for this one. It's a 72 year old diabetic who's admitted for worsening chronic osteomyelitis, treated with six weeks of IV vancomycin and zosin, no significant improvement. Her creatinine is 1.6, elevated from 1.2 a few from a month ago. Her urinalysis also shows blood and protein. Her urine sediment does not show the cast, uh, RBC cast, but it does show several RBCs. Here, her complement levels, both C3 and C4, are normal, and you have a normal ASO, ANCA, rheumatoid factor, and cryoglobulin. So this is your history here. Um, rather than go um, discuss the differential, let's let's just jump right into this biopsy and let's let's make the diagnosis. This one's tricky as well. So this is again light microscopy H and E staining. Um, the tubules commenting on those first, they do look a little spaced out. They're clearly not back to back in all areas. Um, and then uh, towards the 11 and 12 o'clock position, you see the tubules. The, uh, again, the structure is a little distorted. You kind of appreciate the basement, um, the brush water epithelium and those very clearly there's some intraluminar uh, debris there so there could be component of a cutibular injury um, right right one other thing I'm pointing out here is just some maybe it's hard to appreciate at this magnification but some coarse endicalization that we might right. see in this particular tubule which and some cytoplasmic blebbing that we're seeing and seeing that here as well going along with the cutibular, the cutibular injury. injury okay um, yeah. then the interstitium uh, not very impressive on the H and E here uh, to comment. I don't see any big blood vessels on there. And then coming to the glomerulus, there's a vessel uh, right yeah, there. right there. So the vessel wall does look a little thickened maybe, to me. Maybe mild. It's, it's kind mild of cut island. tangentially, so it's hard to say exactly how thick this is. But mild down here you're starting to get it. Says. Maybe mild. Mm -hmm. And then coming to the glomerulus. Um, so uh, there are at least three in this view here. Um, Overall, they, uh, again, nothing in the Bowman space, crescents or necrotizing inflammation there. Right. And coming to the capillary loops, a lot of them, again, look close. And um, it's hard to say. I don't know if some of the cells are, again, in intraluminal. Or this looks more like mesangial 
proliferation on this magnification. Well, we'll, we'll see about yeah. that. I'll give you a higher power. Yeah. How, how would you describe like the general architecture like, of the gonna, that I'm, Joe's so, I'm trying to highlight the kind of overall architecture here. Yeah. How you see? Using a non-technical term like a cabbage appearing or bigger... I would I prefer the term cauliflower. Cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you're looking yeah. down and having yeah. a big, I meant cauliflower. <laughs> big uh, yeah. lumps here. Um, and as you're looking down on this, you can mm -hmm. you can see each one of these has this sort of distinct sort of lobular, accentuated Lobular. lobulation. Okay, to each one of these glomeruli. This one we're kind of just getting into part of it, but even there you can see these kind of lobular accentuation to these these glomeruli. Mm -hmm. And there's clearly, as you mentioned, way too many cells in here. You can't appreciate the capillary lumens. It again looks like a proliferative appearance, like a diffuse endocapillary proliferation in these uh, the glomeruli that we that we have here. So. Um, maybe there's some other inflammatory cells mixed in, or maybe some karyorectic debris. We'll have to see what that is on, on higher magnification, these small little um, blue dots that we're seeing at this, this magnification. Yeah, that, that lobular architecture makes me think of diseases like MPGN, which you mentioned in the last one, even though the complements here were, are normal. Um, so let's give you some higher power. This is again like microscopy, HME staining, uh, a little higher power for the glom. Uh, so um, I think towards uh, uh, outside, you can see the capillary loops maybe a little thickened again, but we need PAS and silver to comment on that confidently. Then the mesangial spaces appear hypercellular here. Um, some capillary loops are uh, again closed on there and that is that a small area of this is like you were saying some endocapillary proliferation right here and we do what if, what appears to have some open capillary loops and then this little mesangial expansion and some hypercellularity in some of these but um and do some you, segmental thickening perhaps here joe do you see neutrophils in this image i'm not seeing any neutrophils well, here okay in contrast to the last case right. where we saw quite a few neutrophils right okay so here's another me. Mm. All right, I won't point to it. Let's. <laughs> so, um, the towards the tip of the glomerulus here, mm -hmm. that looks like um, you almost call it like sclerosis or no halenosis. Well, this so. so that's a good point. What is this reddish pink stuff right here? And we have some cells that are outside of the capillary loops in Bowman's space here. Maybe we're just starting to get into this particular feature, but this this kind of reddish appearance like this looks more like fibrin, fibrin. Um, a little necrotizing lesion outside of the capillary loops. So as we get through, we might see some uh, a cellular crescent, or if we're convinced this is within the glomerulus, which it doesn't look like it, focal necrosis, but I bet we're getting into a little necrotizing um, crescentic lesion here and then once again you know, it looks like it's exploding right out of the capillary loop here as the capillary loops rupture that's when you get the inflammatory response and the fibroid necrosis associated with that and then down here we have Don't again see the mesangial expand hypercellularity well this you know loop. this more of an endocapillary proliferation here right rather than just so much mesangial hypercellularity which was more evident on the last one. We don't see those capillary lumens here at all, at all in this particular field. It's filled with all of these with all of these cells. And the same thing out here. Um, <clears throat> okay. Okay. So uh, we actually are done with light. We're going to go to IF. Yeah. So we'll speed I, through this. IgG G looks kind of negative here. Yeah, agreed. Dark. So IgM. IgM is also, also negative. Okay. This is dark. Can sense that I'm building up to something. IgA looks pretty positive here. Uh -huh. Again, granular staining pattern uh, along the capillary loops also, and both in the mesangium too. Yes. Okay, and here's another really nice picture of the IgA. That also, again, looks around the capillaries in the mesangium, coarse granular pattern for mm -hmm. IgA positive immunofluorescence. It looks like a bright green cauliflower. <laughs> 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 okay, here here is a fibrin stain, which uh, we don't always do, but you know this demo, this would correlate to that reddish lesion that we saw, that segmental necrotizing lesion. Um, okay, so let's get EM and let's render a diagnosis. So this is an, this is kind of a tough picture too. 
Well, let's start by orienting yourself here. So uh, that lining is the foot process lining. So right out here are where the foot processes should be. Which looks quite effaced it's here. Effaced right there. And right. outside so would it be the urinary space or the Bowman space. Right. And that is the GBM endothelial fenestration and those are the endothelial cells. And this is all completely closed. closed. This is our endocapillary pr proliferation. Right. Because normally, you know, that would be a big white area, right? It would be an open loop, but this is this this is an EM picture of endocapillary proliferation, right? So again, effacement of the foot processes was seen there. Mm -hmm. Other things, looking at deposits. So from the twelve o'clock to three o'clock area, the uh, there is some intramembranous deposits there. I'm not seeing a whole lot up here in, in the membrane. We do have, you know, you can get condensation of the actin situs going around the outside here. These aren't real deposits. Um, and the foot processes are totally effaced. This looks like where a podocyte maybe has attached. So I'm not seeing too many great looking deposits up here. Maybe something down here. But I would want to look at more images to see, particularly in the mesangial areas, and some better images of the capillary loops to look for more deposits. This highlights an endocapillary proliferation and foot process of Right, yeah, and that was the, the, the point of this image was to, to demonstrate this loop is closed with s cells. I'll, I'll show you the deposits here and you can hopefully try to figure out where they are. All right, so where are the deposits? Uh, so again, the so it's yourself, sides, okay. the G, uh, those are the, supposed to be the uh, right. sides. Right. below good. that is the membrane. And below that would be the capillary lumen, which again looks closed, and mm -hmm. uh, we see the endothelial cell nucleus. So these would be subendothelial yes. in position. Very good. Subendothelial Excellent. deposits. Very extensive. And this extensive. looks like something you might see in a case of lupus. That would be uh, like a wire loop almost. This would be like a wire yeah, loop right. of lupus. But right. of course, this patient doesn't have lupus, and they have uh, no IgG, no C1Q. They just have IgA staining, and this correlates with where the IgA was staining. Okay, so given all of these things, what would you call this? Um, I think I'd, we would still call it IgA dominant infection associated to yes. chronic osteomyelitis. Yeah. That's exactly. Well, can um, we go back? There's well, a couple sure, of sure, things. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. with IgA dominant, so typically mm -hmm. that's a patient with diabetes, which this patient has, and mm -hmm. this patient has an infection which would be classically associated with that. So the other things that we'd like to see to make that diagnosis are some complement activation. C3 staining in the glomeruli too, mm -hmm. and it may also be nice to see some uh, subepithelial humps, mm -hmm. which would be great. Mm -hmm. Did we have any? Did they ever find? Did no. Find so this humps? patient had normal uh, C3 staining, and uh, okay. there were mostly all subendothelial deposits. All subendothelial deposits. Yeah. So, you know, it's it it is certainly on the list of things, mm -hmm. you know, an IgA associated, IgA dominant infection associated glomerulonephritis or, or IgA dominant you know, post infectious. Um, did the patient grow a MRSA? Yes. So that, that yeah, also that, fits, it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, I would probably not be so definitive on okay. this one. Okay. Just, just because of the lack of those other findings. Mm -hmm. Almost always, if you look hard enough in these EMs, mm -hmm. eventually you'll find a home. Really? Okay. In, I, in okay. IgA dominant okay. associated. Okay. Um, and otherwise it's more of an, an IgA type of a, right. type of a picture. Yeah. Which can happen too. Yeah. But with proliferative, you know, it's, it would be a, significant endocapillary proliferation and some necrosis, which can all happen in just IgA right. nephropathy as well. Right. But I would certainly have that have those things on the on the list and you know, probably make it a little more descriptive. Not quite as definitive, but Okay. Say. Joe would hedge his bets. <laughs> So, and that's fine. I mean, it's, I mean, I think this is also kind of a relatively new entity over the last 10 years that has only really started to be described, um, this IgA dominant infection associated GN. Um, as has already been mentioned by um, us, it's uh, uh, risk factors include diabetes, which this patient had, and MRSA infections, which this patient ended up having. Advanced age is also a risk factor. And the pathophysiology is really not the same as the classic post-strep yeah. infection. You know, oftentimes these patients will have ongoing infections and then the GN comes along with it rather than, you know, you have <coughs> strep throat and then four weeks later develop the hematuria. That's really not seen in this uh, Staph aureus type disease. Um, but I think it's it demonstrates kind of like the spectrum of infection associated glomerulonephritis that, you know, in textbooks, everyone always talks about strep, but in 
real clinical life, at least in adults. I can't remember the last post-strep GM that I saw. I think I've only seen one in five years. Um, anything else to add? I would add on that some of the things that we would like to see to really be definitive on this on the biopsy. Sometimes, you know, it's IgA dominant, meaning that there's other immunoglobulin staining here as well. So oftentimes you'll have IgG staining in these, and the but the IgA is much more stronger intensity on the staining than the IgG is in these in these cases. So just something else to add add to that. Excellent. Okay, so um, I've already posted this slide in the beginning, but you can follow me or send me an email at these um, addresses. And thanks to Dr. Gott and Dr. Gupta for doing this uh, talk for us. See you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you.